Hey everyone, Jeffrey here and welcome back to the channel. Uh, today I have Andrew Wade. So Andrew owns his own, uh, I guess, fitness coaching business, yeah. right? Dietitian, <laughs> private practice, whatever you want to call it, fitness and wellness. Yeah, health, health and fitness. But um, so you joined my program around April 2021. And one thing that stood out to me when you joined was you said, well, I actually tried to make the YouTube videos work. Like I actually just tried to rely on the YouTube videos. I delayed joining the program as long as I can, but realized that what am I doing here? Uh, so we'll talk more about that. But, um, you know, you went from April from your wife completely stonewalling you for 10 weeks and then wanting to move out, even seeing other men at that point because she's given up totally on the relationship to, and I think that was in March or April to in December, she's actually prioritizing the relationship with you, deciding to go on dates, initiating dates and operating like a pretty much like a couple in every sense of the word. So I guess, first of all, paint us a picture of how things were when you first came across my videos, uh, when you first joined the program, like what was your situation like? Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> you're going to take me, you're going to make me go back there. No, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it was one of those things where, you know, I remember as beginning of last year, like you mentioned, she, she got into a state of stonewall, you know, I wasn't safe to share. Um, so she just kind of froze. She went inward. She was trying to sort through some scary thoughts and she didn't think that I was the person that she could think through them with. Um, and I kind of proved that I did, I did what a lot of guys do. I was, I noticed that she pulled away. It was uncomfortable for me. I, I inquired and, um, inquired again and then panicked a little. And honestly, I remember the reason I found your videos is because after about four or five weeks of that stonewalling weird behavior, I had like kind of a, a meltdown where I was like, do you not like love me anymore? Are you not attracted to me? Like what's happening? Like I, I kind of freaked out and I walked out of that room and I went, who was that? Because that's not who I am. I've never felt that needy in my life. And I went, Oh, I don't like that at all. Um, and so I started actually look into like ways to communicate with stonewalling. And I, you know, whispered down the rabbit hole, read all the articles. and I stumbled upon one of your videos on stonewalling. And all I can say is that you speak my language's brain, not my brain's <laughs> language. That's what I meant to say. There we go. My brain's language. And it's just like the way you describe things and explain things, the, you know, the antithetic, which I didn't know what that was at the time, but that sort of, you know, alternative perspective of like, you know, stonewalling could also be this. It doesn't have to be someone being a terrible person. You know, I started going, that's kind of what it feels like. It seems like she's hurting, you know, like, and so it just <laughs> really clicked. So I found you amongst my, um, my scavenging for hope and ideas. And I started to find myself listening to your videos because they gave my logical brain a sense of calm and they allowed me to start to sort of think about emotions. And I wasn't sleeping very well. So I was getting up at four thirty-five in the morning and I would go on a run and I'd listen to one of your YouTube videos every day. And it kind of like gave me some hope primed me. And then I could go into my very busy work schedule and I could be a sane, functioning, competent <laughs> leader of my business. And then I'd come home and I'd listen to them as much as humanly possible. And, um, it was, so it's, I, I found you as sort of that initial resource is really where I was at. But my brain was, it was desperately searching for answers essentially. And you were that first yeah. pillar that felt, felt right, but I wasn't quite sure what to do with it from there, you know? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that stonewalling video because I actually, when I was uh, trying to make that video, I hesitated for a very long time because I knew it was going to be very controversial. And even to this day, I think it's still one of my most controversial videos where I get a lot of comments going like, oh, you are perpetuating abuse or whatever it is. It's like, no. if you get it, you get it. If you don't want to get it, it's like, ah, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm no, glad exactly. and that's, I saw that exactly. one. And you actually yeah. say that in the video. You're like, you know, what I'm going to say is kind of controversial, but it's to be fair, when I was literally reading a lot of the other content about stonewalling, I kind of felt that. I, I, it was weird because, you know, you get all these like alpha things that are like, oh, you just need to be a man and like, you know, show them who's boss. And it's like, well, that, that kind of seems like I'm choosing ego and sort of like deferring my emotions or protecting myself or like, you know, deferring to my inner child. Like, it doesn't really seem like I'm being very adult by doing that. Well, Correct. yes, while stonewalling may have its immature origins like it, it's worth noting that there might be some empathy you can give there so when i listened to it I, that's what i felt i was like i was like exactly this doesn't seem like it's this like vicious controlling thing and maybe there's instances where it can be that 
this seems like someone who's in a lot of pain that is trying to protect themselves from more pain. And right. if I'm a part of that pain, don't I want to know what I did? You know, it's just, <laughs> I don't know. It seems yeah. like, especially in what's supposed to be a loving relationship, maybe a better step one, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So just to summarize a bit, right. Uh, basically lost all hope. She moved out uh, and you got all needy. <laughs> And so you joined the program. So, so you found me in March of 2021 and you joined the program around April. Um, and I think when you joined the program, you got some very quick success, some very quick wins where your partner actually decided to come back. Tell us more about that experience. Yeah. So it was like, it's funny because as I look back, I realized that some of it was less a success from what I did and more just like a natural, natural unfolding of events. But, um, and I was telling you and I can, we can dig into this down the road. It's I, all I can think of when I think of this is the iterations of this journey on my side, but I will say I, she moved out of the master bedroom in end of February. And when mm. she started sleeping in the other room was when I started watching videos that then led to, uh, I don't think I want to live here anymore. I think I need more space because I was just like, Hey, you okay yet? What's going on? Talk to me. You know? So it was like, I kept perpetuating that negative feedback loop. And she kept saying, I need more space. I need more space. So March was when she started talking about the, I don't have any hope. I don't see a future. Maybe we need to live separately. April was when we basically said, okay, let's buy you a second house so that you can go move into it and we can be separated. And then I started the course when we found that house. And um, okay. so that's, and I think you said, like, uh, oh my God, it felt yeah, weird. And I think you said Memorial Day weekend, you spent like 10 grand on furniture to, uh, yeah. to furnish the new house. <laughs> yeah. And so, so that's, was, that was, was the time. Where it was, was already <laughs> happening. It was in motion, that plan. Yes. Yeah. So like, yeah. it was like end of April was like, we found the house. She was leaving. She was like, hanging out with people that I didn't really, you know, wasn't, wasn't thrilled she was hanging out with because she needed support and I was not that. Um, and then the key, the part that you mentioned, right, is that we were supposed to close on the house like that Friday of Memorial Day. So like a month later. So I bought your, you know, d- bought into the course and I had like 30 days until she moved out. And I was just, I tried to listen to the entire course because I swore there was some little thing that my brain was just missing that was going to just like, fix it. Um, and what ended up happening that week before Memorial Day, we talked about, hey, let's buy furniture for it. Let's split the cost of the furniture. We did all those. And I was starting to get better at like some framework stuff. So I was at least mm-hmm. like asking and that kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. We bought a bunch of furniture. And then she that later that week literally goes, I don't want to move. <laughs> and so we canceled the furniture orders. We went on a trip. Um, and, she and I think that was probably the moment, if you were like most people, the moment we were like, fuck yeah, I got it down. Uh-huh. Um, but she didn't then- stay because I had changed. She stayed because <laughs> of how shitty the alternative was. Okay, yeah. 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 So <laughs> she came back basically out of the need to come back. And not out of like, because I want to be here, but like, ah, I got nowhere to go here. Yeah. Um, versus need. Huge, huge distinction yeah. there. And I... I was very delayed in my understanding of that distinction. I was like, oh, good. That means we're working on things. Not quite. No. no. <laughs> and I want to dive deep into that later on because that's a really big topic um, that I'm going to start to introduce in the program as well in the next couple of weeks here. It's the concept of like, you know, when your partner makes a decision to come back to you, did she make a decision out of surrender or no? Right. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, so just a sneak peek here, what, what is to come. Um, so anyway, in June, you realize, oh shit, she's coming back, but it's not a good relationship. Like we're still not talking. We're still not a couple. Um, yeah, and she wants to, guard, yeah, and, 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 she, and she's probably thinking every single day, like, how can I get out of here every single day? And you're thinking, well, I think she wants to get out of here every single day. Mm-hmm. Right? And so that was when you committed to the program for real this time. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. so that was I when, checked her phone. yeah, that yeah, was, yeah, you checked her phone, phone. and so <laughs> I'm guessing you discovered her talking to other people, et cetera, at that point or no, quite the opposite. I, 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 in my own mental insecurity had, I was like convinced that she was still talking to people. Oh, and okay. <laughs> I checked her phone and she wasn't. Um, and, but I, she found out I checked her phone first of all. So I got caught, 
which completely destroyed her trust in me, came off as super insecure, but then reinforced to me that I had been sitting here working on this bulletproof vest and been working on all these things, like the concepts in the course that I loved, that I thought were fantastic. It's like, like all lip service. Yeah, exactly. Or at least they were very, very weak at that point, right? Like <laughs> I, I felt them, but I might've needed to listen to a video and I felt yeah. them for an hour after that. And then they died. They were not internal. I did not, I, I was not being that. There was no identity shifting happening. There was a lot of things yeah. to make it going on. Yeah. So once you committed yourself to the program in June, and I remember the, and I was looking at the history of your posts going back and I was like, okay, this is fast. This is fast, actual growth, internal, but also the outcome caught up fast as well. So give us a timeline here of what happened after June, when you finally recommitted, made the internal shifts, understood the frameworks and guided the conversation properly for the first time. Yeah. The, I, I, the most concise thing is I'm not always the most concise person I can say is that she started to feel the difference because it became more authentic, right? Instead of me just trying to say something that I thought I was supposed to say, I was able to communicate what I felt. And then I was able to calm myself so that she was able to express herself, which meant she then had an environment that she could start to build some emotional safety. And so it led to me more effortlessly communicating to her. And she started to see an emotional side of me that I realized I had withdrawn from her or during COVID in particular, um, which they always say you got to go first, right? And that was that was what happened is <laughs> essentially it was in July, I remember after that, after I checked her phone, that was kind of the big call of like, hey man, you're you're not actually bulletproof. Like you still have clear like clearly you still have some trust issues, some struggle. Your emotional safety is not anywhere to be found. Like there's a lot of a lot of things that you really need to like sort through for you before you're ready to be that thing for her. And so um, started recommitting to the program. And I, I did a trip in July and it was funny. I was running on the beach one morning and it reminded me of when her and I were running. And we were at a point where we were like texting and stuff. And it was funny because I like thought of her and my brain was like, I want to text her that I'm thinking of her. And then my brain went, is that really needy? Like, do you need to do that? And then there was like a, well, like, what do you want to get out of it? And it was like, honestly, I just want to share that I'm thinking of her. And so it's like my brain started to slow down. I started to see that seat of consciousness. I started to right. evaluate that antithesis. And I don't want to, you know, push too many buttons there, but like <laughs> all these little concepts that I had been regurgitating so that I sounded like I knew what I was doing actually started to flow through my brain on that beach. And I simply just sent her a text that was, it was just a really nice text, nothing crazy, nothing wild. Um, and it wasn't meant to be anything. It wasn't supposed to be a deep conversation. It was just sharing and it was really well received. But mm -hmm. even if it hadn't been, I sent it for the right reasons for the first time. And that was that click of like, ah, this needs to come for me, from me, by me. There, there's, it, it, it led to that internal side. And so July is when I started to understand what you meant by internalizing and recreating that identity yeah and then fast forward to now february i mean <laughs> tell, tell, tell us how that how is things yeah. that things are like now man yeah no so <laughs> things are good it's all i can say it's somewhere around the holidays i noticed a shift and it was it was a shift in her um and it was funny because i i, I will i'll do like a kind of a note i actually was mm. i was feeling a lot of it back in october actually we were starting to go on some dates she was starting to engage more there was some flirting happening and we ended up having like kind of a more like intimate fun flirty evening together and then i actually like caught myself slip into some needy kind of question behavior the next day and it immediately put her wall right back up and i saw her push away and i didn't panic I recognized it. I realized it. I sent a video reflecting on it and sent it to her. And then I just went back to doing me. It was, I went back to the process. I was unfazed by the step back. The low tide was not something that like ate my lunch all of a sudden. And November, she pushed me away. And then when she came back, I didn't, I was, I, I had iterated, right. I had basically strengthened it so that I was much, much calmer. I had kind of tightened up that Good. BPP like you talk about. And all of a sudden I come home on Christmas Eve to like this gorgeous dinner for the two of us. And we end up having a fun date night, Christmas night. She starts sharing. She opens up about things. And then fast mm -hmm. forward these last six weeks. I mean, we just did a nine day road trip down to North Carolina with the dogs and we're scouting some stuff for our business down there. And we've got some cool goal alignment going on. And 
Um, we are back to being a team in a lot of ways, partners, and there's still, there's still healing that needs to take place. There's still confirmation biases and aspects of our relationship, but I have a clear understanding of them. We've been able to discuss them. She's been able to express them and there's no urgency. So that environment for her to do that healing exists so that she can at her pace. And man, I, the anxiety that would have existed in an attempt to control that in the past, nowhere to be found. Go nowhere to be found. Um, that's awesome, dude. I, I want to dive deeper into the first kind of takeaway that I want to give people listening to this. For sure. And, you know, you mentioned, I think your story is the epitome of an example of like how you really cannot fake your changes, yeah. right? You legit can't fake it. And I think there's two angles to this. One is the angle of like, I don't have to I have some, my, my notebook here as you're talking. The, um, notebook. <laughs> the waterproof notebook. There we go. Um, one is levels of change, right? So I think a lot of people, like it, it really confuses me sometimes when people like, we go on a call with people, for example, and then they say, oh yeah, yeah I watched your video in Bulletproof Vest. I'm Bulletproof. I'm already Bulletproof. It's like, <laughs> it, it, it's a bit, it makes you a bit speechless, right? Because first of all, it's levels. Yes, you might be level three Bulletproof, but we're talking about level 50. And I think, this often comes with the misunderstanding of what it means to be bulletproof or what it means to be untethered, right? Yeah. Um, and so just to kind of define for us and for you and for people listening here on what I mean by the differences. So we talk about being bulletproof. And I think for a lot of people, their idea of being bulletproof is, let me clench my asshole to keep my shit in, right? It's like, yes, I'm going through a tough time, but let me watch some motivational videos of how I can do it. I can take it. I can take it. But what happens is, you know, when you do this, eventually you're going to get enough resistance or enough tough moments like you to where you slip, you will slip eventually. Subconsciously, you will slip. And sometimes you don't even know that you slip. And that slip is going to undo the house of cards that you've built, right? All the safety you've worked hard to build, that is going to break it down because your partner is going to go, he hasn't really changed, right? When things are tough, he's going to go back to his new self, uh, to, to his old self, hasn't really changed. That's what we call the surviving approach to being bulletproof, right? And you can never really do well with that. It'll always break down. What we're talking about here when we talk about bulletproof is, can you thrive, right? Meaning that the more shit you get, the more you should rise up. It's almost like if you look at an athlete, it's not until this, the last second shot, when things, the pressure is on, when things get hard, they suddenly become their best. So the words... I broke my bulletproof vest because it was really hard. Should never come out of a thriving mindset or, uh, mouth because the harder it is, the more you should thrive, right? That's the level of bulletproofness that we're asking for. A lot of people think it's the former and that's not bulletproof, right? It's like hundred percent and more than hundred percent. It's reverse um, correlated in a way. Yeah. And when we're talking about um, untetheredness, we're not talking about being indifferent. Like, oh, screw that. I don't need her anymore. It's yeah. about wiring your brain to be addicted to the processes, right? And really be committed with the processes, really intrinsically lo love the processes and motivated to do the processes no matter what happens. So this is in the middle of indifference and neediness. It's the want again, want to do the processes, right? I mean, I'm guessing between the moment that you were not so committed to the moment where you actually commit you made that shift as well of understanding what it means from surviving to thriving, what it means to untether, what it means to actually play at the level that you need to be playing at. Right. Agreed. I think that's perfectly said. And it's, <laughs> it's funny. Cause like it's in that the levels is such a good visual for me. I've always really resonated with that because it's that idea of like, there's no shame in going from level one to level 50, right? The journey there is what makes you level 50. And like, you know, you and I are both business people. So like, I always think of it as a CEO, do I want a CEO that was handed $5 million in seed money to start their company and has never had a rainy day? Or do I want a war-torn CEO that's been through a bunch of problems, a bunch of dips, and can now give wise insights as how to go forward? I want that one. I want the leader that knows how to lead in the good and the bad. And so like that concept of removing self-flagellation that you talk about and iterating and getting back to the process all that is, is giving people the framework to go from level one to level 50 and not get mad when they find out they're not level 50. And so that was the key was 
there were quite a few times where I thought I was a level higher than I was. And then I got told I wasn't at that level. But instead of going, ah, screw and getting all upset, I just said, well, back to work, right? That mindset of that persistence. They always say consistency over perfection. And that's sort of that thought of, I think that if, if, you, if you think you're level 50 and then when you find out you're not, you get shattered, you're not bulletproof. If you think you're level 50 and you find out you're level 40 and then it makes you hungry to be level 50, you're creating a bulletproof. It's that yeah. growth mindset, you know? That's yeah. always been so foundational. Yeah, and you brought up a really interesting concept, which is kind of the second point of um, the level. So there's, in this case, we're talking about the levels of bulletproofness, right? It's this concept of fragility, right? Yeah. I think the, the best example of this is you take, let's say, a very solid structure, a rigid structure, solid structure, right? Yes, the structure is strong, but the structure is also very fragile. It's brittle, right? You take a very solid structure that can't bend, you, you hit that thing, eventually, it'll, when it breaks, it breaks, it explodes. And I think that's kind of the visual, a good visual of how a lot of people are. They, they, they think being bulletproof is just being the solid structure where they're perfect. I am flawless, right? They're so rigid about that. But then when pressure comes, they just break, right? Well, I think thriving is more of, uh, for lack of a better word, it's called, I call it anti-fragile, right? Our bodies are anti-fragile where we get sick. After we get sick, we get stronger, right? We're, we're very moldable like that. And I think that's the difference in Bulletproof Vest that we're looking for here. We're not looking for fragile or even robust. We're looking for anti-fragile, right? Yeah. And I think uh, the other thing that you mentioned too is this idea of what it means to be irreplaceable. So we talk about, okay, you're, if, if you are upset that your partner is leaving you, you have to understand that you're asking your partner to spend their one and only life with you. That's a massive ask. Okay. And ask. if you, yeah. right, it's a huge ask. And if you get mad at her for not choosing you, you have missed the point of the whole game. <laughs> right? And it's like, if, if you want someone to spend the rest of their life with you, you better deliver. You better become irreplaceable. And a lot of people take that as going like, well, I need to be perfect then. No, what she's looking for though is not the perfect product. She's looking for the perfect process. Again, it's really hard to feel safe around someone who thinks they're perfect, who thinks yeah. they should be perfect. Because if you point out their flaws, they get upset, right? What, so what you're referring to here is like, there's nothing wrong with admitting that you're in level three or level two or level, even level one, yeah. right? Being irreplaceable does not mean that you're level 100. Being irreplaceable means that you can admit that you're level one and you can get to level 50 and actually give your partner the hope that you will get to level 50 one day through your humility and through the way you can learn from your shortcomings. You know, I think that's what you're referring to, right? Absolutely. And you know, it's, it's funny that the two pieces that resonate there, one of my sayings that I use personally in my business, and then also what's translated to this, um, I, I say to myself every day, sway like a skyscraper. And it's most people don't know this, but like the Sears Tower was architecturally built so that it sways like 50 feet either direction in the wind on a windy day. And that actually makes it a more resolute structure because it, like you said, it doesn't have to fight the elements. It adjusts to the elements, whether we're saying we're being like water, but I always say sway like a skyscraper. And that's been my model <laughs> in our business is, hey, we're, we're a really good, robust company. We have great integrity. We have good vision and values but we're adaptable. We're going to sway like a skyscraper. And that's how you leverage during a pandemic and all those good things. But it's all those concepts translated into this so well. Mm -hmm. and I, well, one of the things I, I would credit you with is you helped me translate a lot of like what I'd almost call business concepts that were like very clear to me as a business person into emotionally relevant and valid concepts, things that were purely logical to me. I was able to actually internalize them on an emotional level which actually made me a more potent business person as well because <laughs> I was able yeah. to sort of embrace the masculine and feminine and the perfection yeah. thing. What's kind of cool, one of the pieces before I accepted that my story wasn't actually unique, the thing that made me feel like my story was unique is I wasn't the traditional like, oh, like I had an affair or I had an alcohol issue or a drug issue. I didn't have like an obvious F up, we'll call it. Um, I was kind of the golden boy, right? Like in my twenties, I built a seven figure business from scratch mm. that took care of us. I put us on the map. I, 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 I did all these things. And so for everybody outside looking in, 
people thought that she was crazy. Her family was like, what are you doing? She had no support, which you go back to why was there an emotional affair? Why was there there other people? Because everybody in our world was connected to me because I was this like somewhat charismatic figurehead and she felt alone, isolated, unsupported. And I created an environment where I thought I was co-creating, but I, I started to do this visual of like, I took an intelligent, beautiful, strong woman, put her in a bubble, put her in a mansion and said, hey, what do you want? I'll go get it. And she eventually got to the point where she went, I'm really smart and have a lot of skills. And like, he doesn't seem to think I'm useful for anything other than a Sunday night, fun night. Like, I'm going to go find somebody that's going to actually think I'm valuable. And so I was the person that I tried to be perfect for her all through our 20s. And that's actually what got me here was trying to be too perfect. And when I finally got to a point where I was like, oh, I do need your help or I do like your ideas, all of a sudden she's like, oh, so like we can be a partnership now. It's like, yeah, we can. Yeah. I know how to be a partner now. I don't have to be the, the solo you know, MVP of everything all the time. Yeah, yeah. And that's the essence of what it means to have an interdependent relationship where you are two separate people, but you're equals. Um, and you're not, one is not dominating the other. The other is not feeling dominated. It's pretty much like equals. And also realizing that both of you are strong in different ways and also weak in different ways. And together, you're a better symphony than you are apart kind of thing. And I think that's a beautiful uh, structure to have in a relationship, unlike how it's portrayed in a lot of media, for example, where people say like, oh, you have to meet someone with a lot of the same interests, the same thing. You have to basically meet you. It's yeah. like, well, that would be a pretty crappy symphony if both are playing the trumpets, you know? <laughs> I love that. That's such a good analogy. That's such a good analogy. Yeah. yeah. And I, I totally see it. And it's, we had a very, when I think back to our relationship, we had a very strong relationship in that we were very good together. And one of the dynamics I reflect on is there was a couple of years there and COVID was not the reason, but it was kind of the part of the timeline where there were some pieces at play in our life that led me to feel the need to like push things forward fast. And Allison is a very um, calculated observer. She's the more quiet. She's, mm. she's the seat of the observer person very naturally where I'm the bull in the China shop. Right. And I, I go <laughs> and I get stuff done. And I took it upon myself to stop checking in with her and just went and got a bunch of stuff done. And it made her feel very left out, very excluded, very unimportant, very neglected. So I cut the ties of our really strong dynamic. And it's not surprising that she got to the point where she said, hey, like I have a lot of value and it's not being utilized here. I'm starting to doubt whether or not this is the right place for me and that he's going to be able to, you know, stop bucking around and doing what he does enough to see what he's missing. And it's uh, Yeah, I think... Uh, this brings me to the second point, and I think this is a really, really good point to make, which is the blind spots that people have when they're first coming to the program, right? <laughs> and I think the hardest part about me creating this program, Andrew, has been I am trying to get people to realize something that is fundamentally very subconscious, fundamentally they're biased about, right? So for example, um, you talk about you thinking that your situation is unique, right? And in the beginning of the program, I tell you, Andrew, your situation is not fucking unique. Yep. I, and I told you so many ways of why it's not unique, but yet you still go, oh, mine is unique, right? Yeah. Because like whatever beliefs you have, whatever paradigms you have and you adopt it and you, you see the world in a certain way and you make decisions from your paradigms and you think the paradigm seems so right to me. Yeah. But what you don't realize is like, no, you, the fact that your paradigm seems right to you does not mean it's right. Exactly. <laughs> right? Especially exactly. if you're not getting the outcome that you want. Yeah. Um, so tell me like, so you mentioned two epiphanies, right? One is like, okay, my situation is not unique. Second is all these things, all these ways I think I've been creating safety in my relationship, I've actually been destroying it, right? All these things I think I've been creating value, I've actually been creating negative value. Mm -hmm. What other <laughs> epiphanies or like pa key paradigm shifts did you actually have to get you to wake up here? Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's, it's funny because even when I reflect on what you just said, it, it kind of spiked one in me, which is like when I think about how I started the course, right? So, for example, when I found out about the, um, the affair partner, right? I didn't do all the things that people typically do because I had been watching your videos, I had been preparing and I had 
I had already come to agreement with the idea that this was a symptom of a bigger problem. And so I even like fumbled my way through frameworks and explained probably too logically at that time that, you know, I don't see this as anything other than a symptom of a problem with you and I, you know, this is a side effect of things that are going wrong internally. And I want to dig into those. So like, that's an example where I had like, I had some growth, but going back to what you mentioned when you said like, Oh, well, like your situation's not unique. I was embracing like segments of that, right? Like, so I took that idea and I went, you're right. Like the concept of an affair, not unique. This is similar. This is similar. But in the back of my head, there was definitely still this part that was like, yeah, but like, see, I'm this like really special guy. <laughs> so like, <laughs> it wasn't that my situation was unique. It's that my ego needed to be checked at the door. And I think that it goes back to some of the, I think it's some of the overlap and I kind of alluded to this, but you know, like you said, I'm a wellness fitness coach kind of guy. I do a lot of behavioral work. I have like a, you know, more of a therapy type background and coaching type background. So a lot of the concepts in the course weren't necessarily new to me. It's just, I had been eating them for breakfast as business material for the last five or six years. Right. I was this highly successful entrepreneurial young guy that was reading all the books and doing all the things. So I think initially I heard a lot of this and I went, yeah, I know this information, but that didn't mean that I was able to apply it. And it didn't mean that I was living it. It didn't mean I identified with it. And it definitely didn't mean that I knew how it resonated and connected to this emotional side of me. And so I think that's yeah. probably the biggest epiphany I had was that like a lot of this stuff logically existed in my brain, but emotionally was absolutely disconnected. And so I had this logical level that seemed really high. Um, but when you looked at the emotional side, it was nowhere to be found. And that was kind of the, that's where the click or the flip happened. That's where that text message in July I mentioned started, <laughs> where I started to realize like, she knows I'm intelligent. She knows I'm hardworking. She knows I'm, you know, super analytical. These aren't things that she didn't know when she decided to leave. She feels disconnected from you. And it's because you do a really good job of telling. Um, you coach other people for a living. You need to be coached. You need to become more coachable. And that's, it's hard to that accept was, that. Yeah, exactly. It's hard to accept that. And I think, you know, the, the thing that people need to know is our course is not the cheapest, right? And yeah. it's, we have a lot of pretty high power people in here. We have surgeons, we have politicians, we have like really business leaders like yourself, right? These are not dumb people. Like I'm not going here and telling people like, oh, here, I'm just like getting the money from really stupid men who doesn't know how to figure life out. It's like, no, these are very successful men. But again, it's one thing to logically understand a principle, but it's another thing to walk to walk, right? And between logical understanding and emotional, deep, you know, identity-based application, you have to realize that there's a lot of blind spots. We talk about the paradox of logic, the, um, the paradox of change, and all these things that's like, no, these are paradoxes because you think you're doing something right, but you're actually not. And it takes a very humble and very strong person to be able to go, look, Obviously, if I'm at my situation, something is wrong. Like if I like if for you, if I'm fat, okay, and I don't and I, and I spend like ten thousand hours researching diets, but I'm still fat, something is obviously wrong. Okay, I need to humble myself. And so, for people who are watching, right, if just understand this quote, uh, just pay attention to this quote. It's like you cannot use the same knowledge that you use that created the problem in the first place to solve your problem. Now, if you take that really far, you can also see how some people, I present to them a solution. Hey, um, seeing your partner stonewalling and just as narcissism and, and just playing on that may not be the best idea. And they get upset, they get offended. Or they, we go, oh, you probably need to look into, inside yourself and really understand how to create safety. Your relationship is broken, not because of all these things you're thinking, but because of the lack of safety, they get, oh, how dare you say, oh, why is it always about me? But like when people are doubting these solutions, you have to ask yourself, what thinking am I using to doubt these solutions? Probably the same thinking that got me to the problem in the first place. So how can you use the same thinking to doubt a solution to, you know what I mean? It, it, it's crazy. Exactly. Well, it's, it's, and would you, you actually, 
it's funny because I think about this, me as a coach that was struggling with the concept of being coachable, right? And so like I got I joined the course, I tried to hyper learn it because I was like, I <laughs> I know a bunch of this intellectually, which means it's gonna it's gonna sink in real quick. And I'm a fast learner and I was great in school. Like this is, you know, again, going back to the ego. And I did one coaching call with you. And in the coaching call, the thing you pointed out, which it echoed and rippled across my months that followed, was my microtones. And the microtones were that I was judging her because my hypothesis, I, I was so confident in my hypothesis, right? And so then you go back to this idea of what I kept seeing over and over again was that vision of putting the girl in a bubble in a castle and then going and doing my thing because what I'm doing is right. And so like, she's going to see that. Well, once again, like you assuming, you know, what she wants, what she needs, what's good for her. And then going and bringing it to her is what got you here. And so you <laughs> still continuing to assume that you're doing this course, you're doing these things and you assuming how she feels, it's not going to work again. And so you said it so perfectly. And even when I was trying to be understanding of her decisions and not beg and plead, but also not control. I was still making judgments and assumptions about what she was doing. And I was communicating to her in a way that was condescending. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing that, that continued to ripple is even when I stopped saying them out loud, she could still feel it. I was not creating an environment that she felt safe, respected, or equal in. And until that environment started to exist, there was no world that she was going to come back because she knew it was just going to be more of the same. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, recently um, we've increased the price of our program um, because I really wanted to work, we'd be a bit more choosy with who I work with, right? Because again, sure. this is the, the concept of being coachable or not. Some people are just not ready to be coached. Yeah. They're not ready to put their ego down and they're not ready to just say, maybe I don't know what I don't know. Maybe my changes aren't really that awesome. Maybe I'm not really that awesome, right? Maybe there's something severely wrong with me. And it takes a brave person, a brave soul to be able to say that. Um, and I think it took you a while to say that. It takes me a while to say that, right? Oh, for sure. Um, Absolutely. But the but, but the thing is without, is <laughs> yeah, but the thing is that without doing that, you're basically saying, I have all these blind spots and I'll I don't care about finding my blind spots. I don't care. Right. Totally People are true. telling you like, dude, you have all these blind spots. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 no. I know my path is right. It's like, okay, so be it. But once you let the ego down and you let people figure, you know, tell you your blind spots and you go, oh, there's a much better answer than where I'm going. And I'm glad I took it before it was too late. And some people, for some people, it's like, they're like 70, they're like 80. And they finally realize this. And you're like, I'm only have five years, 10 years to live with this new mindset, it's like, oh, what a shame. You know, that's the biggest shame, I think. And I it goes back to what we talked about earlier, which is if you're someone who cannot admit their mistakes, who cannot look at their shortcomings in the face and go, ah, I have that, and then be antithetic enough to actually discover some answers from some people who actually know what they're doing, then if that's so hard for you, it should be no mystery why your partner wants to get out of Dodge. Because she can't even tell, like if, if a coach can't tell you, can't teach you, mm -hmm. right? She can't teach you. She can't tell you. And if she can't tell you, nothing is going to change. If nothing's going to change, she's not going to spend her one and only life with you. Let's be honest here. Okay? She's going to spend her entire <laughs> life being heard and uh, unheard and ignored. That sounds awful. That sounds terrible. <laughs> it sounds like the reason that women were fighting for women's rights so they could get away from that reality that plagued them. So like, it's like, yeah, we've, we've come far enough that like, that's not what should happen anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is this concept of urgency that you mentioned in the beginning, um, which is, you know, the unfortunate reality of my job sometimes is people wait till the very last second before they seek my help. Right. It's like, let me wait before the, uh, the day before I die or like the day before I get divorced so that I will invest something. Yeah. Before that, I would tell him like, hey, it's, you know, it's a couple of grand, a few grand, but this is going to change your life. And they're like, yeah, it's okay. I'll, I'll figure it out. Yeah. Then they're like, oh, shoot, I can't figure it out. And then they wait till the things are very dire to seek my help. 
And so the concept of urgency illusion or urgency for us, it's not new. Like we enroll 1,500 people every single year and almost every single person face what you face, which is like, I am days away from divorce. I'm days away from something really bad. I need to do something now, mm -hmm. right? So you've been in the program. You see the people going through this urgency illusion, whatever it is. Can you just describe to people like how when I say your situation is not dire, <laughs> your partner is willing to wait longer than you think. Can you just describe your experience of how you see that now? Like, Oh yeah, absolutely. It's, and it's so <laughs> cool because urgency to me, and it's, you've said this, but it goes back to the concept of levels. Every concept that you discuss has levels to it. Right. And so kind of like how I mentioned before, like I was um, when it came to like the, situation not being unique well there's like levels to that there's like the, the macro level which is just like you being a guy that needs to adjust and make better connection with yourself so that you can better connect with others but then there's the micro version which is like an affair is not unique or someone moving out or sleeping in the other room is not unique and like i was doing a good job of the micros but was struggling to accept the macro i would say it was the opposite for this one for, with urgency where like I visualized the, the, the higher level of like, this is something that has time, which was in my, initially I didn't, right? I bought the course, mm -hmm. went through it in two weeks because she was leaving in a month and oh my gosh, oh my gosh. But when I got through it, the urgency thing was the thing that stood out to me because I realized she had never said the word divorce in my, in my case, right? Mm -hmm. She said, I want to move out and get some space because I think it's the only thing that might help us help me figure out what's going on, which is translated loosely into, I want to give this some time to get better, right? So there's time being stated mm. in the subtext. And so once I started to kind of like catch on to that, there was that urgency, that big picture urgency of, oh my God, I'm going to be divorced in a month. She's going to be gone forever and I can never get her back. And, you know, I'm going to have to share time with the dogs and half of our assets and <laughs> business. And what do you do with this? And can I still talk to her parents? You know, you just, you, you, you I, I hope the that laundry list just <laughs> listen to that is like, yeah, that. If you can calm that macro one and realize that one, you can always get back together. Like there's no piece of paper that is permanent or impermanent. Things are allowed to ebb and flow. Mm. You start to get rid of this big picture urgency. The thing that I actually struggled with more was what I call micro urgencies. So for example, like I would think of a campaign that I want to bring up and then I would feel urgent need to bring that campaign up. If I didn't, if I thought of a campaign and I didn't get to talk to her about it in 48 hours or less, I was ready to explode. Like I was like a, I was like a teapot ready to burst. Just like, I want to talk about it. I want to talk about it. And then my brain would start to flagellate me and go, see, you're avoiding the conversation. You should be, you know, you should be, uh, <laughs> you should be having this conversation. And then I'd be like, yeah, but I'm a farmer. I'm not a hunter. And I would start to just like warp things you were saying, right? Because of this urgency of like, you're supposed to have this conversation. So what I had to do more with the urgency was once I realized that big picture, her and I have a lot of history. We met when we were 20, we went through college together, we started a business together, our families are intertwined. We have so many things that are intertwined. If we did decide to go separate ways, we would still work together. We still have our dogs that we definitely consider our children. Like we are gonna have a relationship of some kind for the rest of our life. Once yeah. I was able to embrace that, I went, okay, slow down and recognize that like real change can be felt, get clearer on what she was struggling with, what didn't exist in the relationship, what she needs, and also look in the mirror and figure out like, who do you want to be? This is a really good opportunity to figure out how to be the better version of you. Once I accepted the macro, the micro levels were the ones that I really had to, um, I struggled with, honestly. And to be fair, yeah. every single pitfall I fell into, you know, in, in May and in June and in July, and even one in September and the one I mentioned in October, every single one of them were urgency. They were, they were, they were that was my main one. And, you know, I, I mentioned in October, we had like kind of this come close where there was some intimacy and there was some connection and there was some fun and I wanted it to keep going up. I wanted the high tide to go a little higher. And when it started to dip, I urgently tried to salvage it. And I did it in a really stupid way. And so my micro urgencies 
were my bigger problems because those are the day to day ones. Those are the who I really want to talk to or I want to practical talk to. ones. Yeah. Yeah. So like, let's summarize for people the macro a bit, right? Yeah, so sure. because in this program, we see so many cases like yours is not even close to the most dire, right? It's like so many more dire things. And whenever people email me saying like, well, my partner is doing this. I'm, I'm facing this. Can you help me? Is this possible? I'm like, did you even watch anything? I Do you even hear anything I say? Like, I don't understand. Like, why are you asking me this question? But it's like the, the reason why we say on the macro sense, there's no nothing as urgent. There's nothing that is urgent, right? Because again, the goal here is your partner just needs some hope that things can be better in the future, okay? And she needs some hope that this fantasy that she has about being with her Prince Charming, who can give her the fulfillment, emotional fulfillment that she wants, is going to be there eventually. She doesn't need you to be perfect. She just needs that hope, okay? And when you can create that hope for your partner, simply just by being humble for a bit and just saying like, Maybe the problem is with me. Because again, if you can't even admit your mistakes, your partner has zero hope for even considering anything. It's like, I, I want to get out of there because this guy doesn't even realize his mistakes. But if you simply just realize your mistakes and just humble down and say, I want to work on myself, and you feed your partner that hope, you'll be very surprised at how long <laughs> they're willing to wait how much opportunities they're willing to give you, how much, how closely they're willing to watch you. And they're not going to say this, right? No, because again, we talk about the paradox of change as another topic entirely. They're not going to say this because they want to see what do you do when things are really hard, when things are hopeless, because that's when they really get to see is this real or is this some conditional thing that he's doing that's going to stop once I get back with him, All right? And once the motivation goes away. So if you can give her that, right, that you, the hope that you are on the right trajectory to growing, whatever timelines she has placed, whatever timelines you place, whatever timelines, whatever places, it doesn't really matter anymore, right? That if you become irreplaceable, so irreplaceable that she can't find anyone like you, she can try all she wants, she can't find anyone like you sure as hell beats better than being alone mm -hmm. where you change so massively so consistently that she can forget about who you were before it doesn't matter where you are in your process of divorce or breaking up whatever it is it doesn't really matter that's the macro sense it's you never forget that right and that's why we say no situations ever too dire or too unique because of that now let's look at the micro sense as well you know we always say the answer to life is never in the extremes, but in the middle, right? So a lot of people are always very concerned about what do I say, right? It's like, oh, should I contact her or should I not contact her? Should I say this or should I not say this? Like, that's not the issue. The issue, the issue is not the what, it's the how, right? If you have the right how, you can dance in whatever conversations you want to dance in. If you don't have the right how, you can do no contact or contact. Both will fail. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think the point here is like, we're trying to ask people to be surgical with their approach. Like being, being dedicated does not mean that you're going in guns blazing like Rambo. It's you're a surgical campaigner. You're a general, right? You know when to go in, you know when to come out, you know when, what to say, when you know what to pull what card at what time, whatever it is, you are surgical, right? And your partner is not looking for lip service from you anymore. She's fucking sick of your promises, right? Mm -hmm. So the last thing you should have is the urgency to, get, to go, I need to say something. No, you don't. She doesn't want you to say anything. She wants you to retreat, go away for a bit and actually change for real. That's what she wants. She wants you to not say anything. <laughs> so for people who are feeling this urgency, just think about that. She doesn't want you to say anything anymore. You probably said everything already. <laughs> uh, too many times, over and over and over again. I know the um, the one I got in the in the summer was the, you know, like not everything has a deep meaning behind it. Some things are just things. And she's like, you don't have to overanalyze everything I do. That that was yeah. some of the 
it's funny. Those weren't even what I would take as resistances. Those were just honest feedbacks. Like that wasn't resistance to me. That was like, that's really her just like saying like, Hey, by the way, like, I know you're like trying to be more, but like, <laughs> yeah. this isn't too much. This isn't the time <laughs> anymore. And, and that's what happens. And that's, I love the, you know, the hunter versus the farmer and you know, those types of things to help sort of pave that, but it is those micro urgencies because you want it's, you know, those urgencies are always related to that outcome. You're not in your process. You're back at your outcome, trying to, trying to nudge things forward, trying to, you know, coax that next high tide to go just a little higher, trying to squeeze, squeeze whatever out. But um, every single time there's, there's been so many instances where you try and force the conversation before she's ready to have it. And it actually either destroys safety or creates a disconnect. That's not even necessarily because it's unsafe, but just because it just, it's almost repulsive. And it's, I, it is I, repulsive. I, yeah. yeah. And I think I want to bring it to my fourth point here. And this is a new point I'm trying to consider. And I think this will be very ex- exciting for you to kind of discover too, along with me, is the concept of, of surrendering to a decision, right? So let's define what that means for a bit. So you look at every decision you made. Let's say you look at the job you've chosen, um, the house you chose, right? <laughs> Whatever, every decision you make. There's two kinds of decisions. It's the decisions you make where you haven't really truly surrendered to it yet. And this is when you go to a decision, let's say you take a job and you go, and you're still thinking a lot about, ooh, I don't know, man. And you're considering alternatives, but you can't really just surrender and buy into that decision. You know, you're always like using your logic to go, oh, is this the right decision? But then there's other decisions where you just say, fuck it. Going all in, both Mm -hmm. feet in, and when you go both feet in, you're not even thinking like, did I pick the right job? You're thinking, why is this job right? <laughs> and you're getting more obsessed every day, right? Those are the two kinds of decisions to make. And I think when the, the, the misunderstanding I think people have about the process of reconciliation is that they think, oh, you change yourself. You say all the perfect things. You become like super suave or whatever. And suddenly she just shows, she goes like, oh, let me come back to you. <laughs> but it's not the case because this is the decision needs to come, to come from two people. Right. Mm-hmm. And what a lot of people can't do is they, they cannot allow their partner enough freedom, enough time and space to actually be able to gather evidence, to gather feedback, to gather data, to surrender to your decision, to her decision. Mm-hmm. Right. Because they're not, they're, they're too th- tethered. They're too impatient. They're too much of a hunter. And they're like, oh, I, 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 I can't let go. Right. So, so a great example of this is I think you went through a, a time when you actually in December, I think, gave her some time and space. Like, look, you figure your stuff out. Right. I'm going to be in the background here. You come back whenever you're ready. And I think when you look at a lot of the people reconciling in the program, they also have to go to the stage where, look, you're in limbers with someone else. You have fallen in love with someone else. Go explore that. Right. Go explore that. Go explore being single. Go explore whatever it is you want to explore. That's fine. All right. Um, and that time is crucial because in order for you to surrender to your decision, you need two ingredients. You need a lot of evidence that the decision you made was the correct one, but you also need to have explored the pros and cons of other alternatives. You have to. Yeah. And it's like almost like, you know, if you give someone chocolate and they've been eating chocolate all their life. They're like, oh, chocolate flavored ice cream tastes great. Like, I love it. But then you're always going to be wondering what does tiramisu taste like? Vanilla or like strawberry. You know, and, and if you say to someone like, no, you, you cannot have strawberry. You cannot have vanilla. You can only have chocolate. You're always going to be wondering, oh, they can never be fully surrendered to chocolate. Yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. It's the same it, thing here. You know? I, I love the, the distinction. It's like all the different reasons why you could What's the, you know, what is the, what's the recipe of a decision that you can just say like, absolutely yes, boom, done versus those decisions. And like, I feel like there's so many things, like you said, as you like kind of build that idea out that you could see what are the things that slow a decision down. And when you're talking about a reconciliation with a spouse that is confirmation bias, that a relationship got to the point where there was that much unhappiness, there's going to be obvious traumas and fears that are going to delay that decision. Like you said, I think divorces are so high because most people live in their own ego and they also aren't willing. They're like, Oh, time's up. You know, I'm too good for this too. And then 
they go and repeat the same problems in, in the next iteration of their life as opposed to using the time for mutual growth. That's, that's what's so profound about your group, these men, like you said, these people that are really more than any of the other, like, you know, the courses I dabbled in before I really go in with you, um, is that there is sort of that willingness to like, hey, I understand why she's going to need some time to see this. To be honest, I'm going to need some time to be this. So why don't we just like buckle in, take some time, take yeah, this journey, both of us. let this be our reality, right? Like live in it, embrace it, make the best of it. And it's, it's funny, my dad and some other people in my life have been like, you know, this like separation, it's like, you're not just like handling it well, you seem to be thriving in it. And I'm kind of like, <laughs> well, like, it's not that I wish it on somebody. I was like, but honestly, it's the wake up call that I needed, right? It's, it's the thing that called me to action to be the next version of me. Um, and I'd be an idiot not to, not to answer that call. And so you've done a, a wonderful job of creating one, a course that, that drives that, but also, it, you know, a community that thrives with that same ambition. So that's, yeah, I, yeah. I, I it's incredible. Yeah, and I, It's incredible to see the community and the people and their attitudes towards it. It's like, I think whenever I tell people about the stuff that goes on in the program, um, it sounds a bit unbelievable. It's like men do that. Like people do that, you know, um, people can think like this or like achieve this. But yeah, I mean, got to just experience it to believe it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's, but it is, it's, it's, it's one of those things where I guess it, there's so many concepts that seem so profound and it's a concept in our society that's meant to be this like terrible, scary, bad thing. So it seems so impossible that it's like, oh, so yeah. wait. Challenges like when I'm, would forge things. It's like, yes, yeah. Because exactly. like when I'm telling people right now, like if your partner is having a limits with someone else, let her. You have to let her. People yeah. are like, are you, are you fucking crazy? Right? Like that's so unchristian. Or whatever it is, right? But like yeah. they don't see the big picture, which is, okay, even if let's say you do get back together and you didn't allow her to have a limits with someone else ever, do you think she can surrender to the decision to be to spend the rest of her life with you? I don't think so. And you're always going to be scared. She's always going to be wanting to get out, right? But yeah. what if you just take this time to let her explore? In the meantime, you become irreplaceable. And if you have indeed become irreplaceable, then everything will turn out fine, right? The only, thing you, the only way you should worry is if you're not really legit, legitimately irreplaceable. That's the only time you should worry. Well said. What's wrong with that? Like, what's wrong with that? That's just treating people like humans, right? Yeah. That's just treating I, people I, like human beings with all their own desires, their own path. In fact, I, I would say if you try to control your partner to come back, that's even more messed up, right? That's even yeah, so much more messed it up. It sounds like you're, you're treating them like their property, right? It's, yeah. You can't, you can't put your own emotions out of it enough to consider theirs. That doesn't sound like an equal. That's not a relationship. And that's not a relationship, yeah. It makes me think of the want versus need that we talked about in the beginning, right? And that's, that's that idea of like, you want your partner to want you. And so if they're mm. not back, it's because they don't want to be back. And that may <laughs> hurt and that may be hard, but like, that's your reality. So like, you can either like let that eat your lunch or you can accept it and figure out what you're going to do about it. But like, yeah. you definitely don't want to make it so that they need you because that's where in my case, one of the things that kind of delayed a lot of it was we had built this life together that was kind of built on a lot of my friendships. And again, some of my financial successes, there was a lot of me infused. So her life post separation radically changes where mm -hmm. mine really wouldn't have. And she even communicated that. I and mean, she said, if I leave for you, nothing changes other than that I'm gone. If I leave for me, everything changes. And mm -hmm. I recognize like, okay, I don't want her to feel like obligated to be here. So I, I spent time trying to do two things, which was if she really does want to leave, how can I help her create an exciting and enticing alternative reality? How can I give her plan B a little bit of, you know, little sprinkles on top so that it's like a truly safe place that she can go if that's where she wants to be. And then you spend the rest of the time making sure that if she does choose to stay, it's because she wants to be here because she's decided. And so it's, but to do that, you're going to have to like live in this sort of like limbo, limbo. And seeming indecision. And like you said, you can either choose to sit here and like pretend you're the best and you're just waiting, or you can actually become the best so that it just reinforces what she's feeling. And there's been a, yeah. there's been a couple of things that have happened recently that have been kind of fun that I've noticed because you, you said it earlier to me, 
it was like she pulled back in November and I recognized immediately what happened. It kind of, and, but the, the difference was I then didn't chase her. I wasn't like, no, 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 no. I didn't. I just like said, Oh, yep. I see what happened there. She's going to take her space. And when I saw her, I was still excited to see her eager to have conversations you know, normal me, but I didn't take her pull away personally. It didn't eat my lunch for the first time. And I know she felt that. And it also was something that was like, wait, I'm not being chased anymore. There was, and so there was this kind of like general comeback towards me. And lately what I've been noticing is, you know, we've been doing a lot more date nights, you know, going on trips, having a lot more of our normal relational stuff. Um, and I still get these little tests. You know, I, I see her still, kind of poking and testing occasionally. And I recognize that's because she's trying to make sure she's safe. She's still healing. She's trying to make sure that I am the safe thing that she's feeling that I'm becoming and that she wants me to be ultimately. The thing she wanted from the get-go, the thing I wasn't, the reason she felt she needed to leave. And what's been fun about it is now I'm in a place, and obviously we always learn, we always iterate, but I had one this, uh, the other morning that you'd, you'd really appreciate. She sent me, I sent her a text message that it was just like a common, normal back and forth, just us chatting text message. But it, what I said triggered in her two of her biggest, my insecurities, basically in the past, Mm -hmm. when she's talked about where she always thought I was really confident, secure, and she saw some insecurities, two of them were like connected to the topics of that text message. Okay. And so her response where I was just sharing something funny that happened, it was a real weird morning. And I was just like, whoa, this happened. Her response was basically like, you don't have to be so extra about it. Just do it. <laughs> and so like she was, it was just like, you could tell that she got really triggered by it. And what was funny is I read that and it was not the text response back. I was expecting to read a year ago, my brain would have felt misunderstood. And I would have, I would have backpedaled and started explaining myself. No, 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 that's not what I meant. This is what I was trying to say. You misunderstood me. Nah, nah, nah. And I, I actually sat in my gym at my house and musing over this because I went, wow, she definitely didn't read that the way I read that in my head. And I kind of laughed and I was like, okay, I have three options here. I can either basically like be really like try and backpedal and explain myself, right? Um, and logic it to death. And what's the outcome there? And I thought about her reading that text from me and her going, okay, like, (laughs) why are we talking about this? And then I thought of the other version, which is I recognize the triggers there, their conversations we've had, fears that she's expressed. And if, ooh, is this a chance to campaign? Like, Mm -hmm. no, we're both about to work out. We're text messaging and we're about to start busy work days. So me being like, oh, I see that your feelings are still being triggered by this. She's going to be like, please don't psychoanalyze me at 530 in the morning. And I was like, ah, option three. And I said, ha ha, gotcha. Um, And then I I said something like real, real basic or joking back. I just said, ha ha, gotcha. I'm glad I did. I'm just glad I didn't oversleep. To which she responded, yeah, luckily I'm really loud in the morning. And then I said, yes, if you weren't clanging and banging like a blind girl in the dark, I would have probably missed my alarm and missed the dye test at our rental property. (laughs) Ha ha ha. She said crying face. Ha ha ha. And then we went about our freaking morning. And I just, but there was an example where like I was in my proper seat of consciousness where I was able to watch the iterations of myself, like the whiny little boy that like would have tried to, I misunderstood, understand me to the analytical psychoanalyst that she was like, Hey, not everything has to be a thing to now the person that's like just content being. And it's like, this isn't something I really needed. And when I responded back to her, I stated what I was actually trying to say. I was trying to just connect. We connected. And what did she get to feel? Oh, he wasn't insecure, which means I reinforced her fear in the positive way. I created a positive, right? And so it's exactly you, know, you have to have a deep conversation to create the positive. Sometimes you can just be. <laughs> yeah. And it's a beautiful feeling. And this is the last point I want to make. And I'm glad you made this point because this is a perfect transition is, you know, there's a three levels of success that we told you in the program, right? Level one is what we call uh, a failure success. That is when you get a destination. And this is what you felt in June, I believe, right? You, you, you get to a destination and you're like, I don't know how I got here. And a lot of entrepreneurs are like this. A lot of relationships are like this, right? It's like, oh, we're happy, but I don't know what makes us special. I, don't, I can't really explain it. I can't really pinpoint it. 
oh, my, my business is taking off, but I don't want really to know why. That's the worst kind of success. Like if I had that kind of success, I would, I would not be able to sleep at night because I know that whether it's there or not tomorrow, it's out of my control. I have no idea what forces are at play here. Right? You might as well have won the lottery, right? Like right, yeah, right, exactly. It's like I don't know, I, I don't know. I, I I just don't know how to replicate it, whatever it is. But a lot of people are very content with that, right? I think what we're the levels again that we're trying to get people to is like let's get to level three, which is successful success. That's when you get success, and you are literally feeling like you're in the driver's seat of everything that you do, of everything that happens. Even when it comes to topic of relationships, that is, people will say is like. Well, you can't control your partner. It's like, well, you can't control your partner, yes, but you can change your partner's behavior quite drastically by changing the way you act. And in fact, you're already doing this, right? A lot of people are already doing this. When you act badly and she wants to divorce, her wanting divorce is because you acted badly. You just influenced her actions in a negative way this time, right? Yep. So the point I'm trying to make here is like, um, Like, it's, it's really like, if you get to the point where you get that successful success, that is the, I, I cannot describe to you how good that feeling is. <laughs> because it feels like, like, just like you, you're like, you're literally seeing everything in slow motion and driving everything and controlling everything, not in a toxic way, but legit, you are understanding how to make your partner feel happy, what she's saying to you, understand fully, like all the principles at play. You can respond in a way that actually makes you happy, makes her happy. And suddenly this relationship, it's almost like whether, you know, if, if you look at driving a car, you're driving a car on a busy street, would you go, oh, I hope I don't crash today? No, because you're driving the car. You're weaving and bobbing and you're pivoting along the way. It's almost the same thing in a relationship. It's like, I will never crash my car, right? It's, it's almost impossible for me. Um, and I will, and I will not let this relationship falter. In fact, I can make sure that it gets to the destination that we want because I'm driving this. I'm driving this right now. And it doesn't matter if like other people are uncontrollable, other cars are uncontrollable. I'm driving my car yeah. around these obstacles. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It, it's, you're right, there's been iterations where you got some wins, couldn't explain what they were, you know, or how they happened, and then, you start to practice and kind of figure out things and you start to kind of, you know, test it, but it comes from sticking to the process because the process is what you iterate. And then it, you fast forward and all of a sudden, like you said, now I'm in this place where I'm able to, I'm, I respond instead of react to things, but I understand the dynamics at play. I'm aware enough of her. I'm aware enough of me. I'm connected with who I am and like what I was trying to accomplish. Right. And so I was able to kind of slow everything down. It's almost like, old school throwback, like out of the matrix, right. Where it's just like, you're <laughs> able to kind of like just control everything a little bit. Um, you know, and it's, it's like, Oh, this is an example of like, I did a, just a basic bid for connection, just a normal back and forth. She definitely felt something that was, you know, that, that was not what I expected. And it's like, Oh, okay. I have a choice in how this goes forward. I definitely have a say, this doesn't need to be a big deal. I don't need to make it a big deal. And you, like you said, I was able to basically nudge it back into a place where it actually felt like a positive to her because she was clearly yeah. having a concern that I was showing some insecurity. And by addressing it the way I did, I didn't have to say, no, I'm not insecure, right? You say that how many times before? <laughs> There's a difference between telling and showing. But like, I didn't need to explain why I wasn't insecure. I just simply yeah. needed to like move forward and it made her go... Oh, good. This wasn't what I thought it was either. And then we proceeded to have a fun morning and talk. Yeah. And go walk when she got home. And it was just like, you move on with your day. And it's, it is. It's, it's like real it's power. Crazy. It's not about, yeah, it's like real power. It's not about what you do, but about the eternal state, right? Yeah. Like, like a lot of people ask, for example, like, oh, if I say this, does it make me look needy or weak? Like you said earlier. It's like, no, it doesn't. Like, what you say doesn't make you look needy or weak. It's why you say it. Yeah. Because people are always going to misunderstand your intentions. Even yeah. if you, do something that appears powerful, your partner could go, ah, oh, he's just doing that to like get me back. What a needy bastard, right? Yeah. It doesn't really matter, exactly. but it's the intention you come with that really matters. Um, been, that yeah. was actually probably one of the harder ones for me, actually. And I, yeah. and I, I want to be mindful of time and all that good stuff. But even this morning, it was kind of fun. Like um, I, I'm heading out, I have to go on a trip with 
um, this evening. And so I'm not going to see her tonight into tomorrow. And we went for a little dog walk this morning and she had to go up a shower and I was leaving and she was walking up the stairs telling me something. And I said, Hey, come back here. And she <laughs> came back down the stairs and I just like grabbed, I wrapped my arms around her and I just said, I need one of these right now. And like, is that needy? No, it's not. It's what I wanted. And it's, but it's to say that it goes back to how I did it. There's a big difference between like, you don't ever hug me anymore. Or like, why don't you want to hug me? Or you didn't hug me goodbye. No, 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 no. It's like, come on, like, hug me, hug me. I want to hug. <laughs> come here, come back here. Grab her real tight. I need one of these right now. Not, do, are you happy? Do you like this hug? Is this, what you do? Like, am I okay? Like all that. Kind of, no, it's, I need this right now. Kiss her on the cheek. She leans in, right? And then you just like, let it be. And it was a positive thing. So that was the part where, because I was trying to make room for her needs, there was a period where I didn't think I was allowed to say the wants that I had. Mm. And I felt that any want I had made me needy, but you said it so perfectly. It's how you do it. It's where it comes from. And it's the expectation you have too, right? Like that, do you need to build this up in your mind? And do you get disappointed by the end result? All I wanted was to wrap my arms around me. (laughs) That was it. That was, that was my entire, I'm pretty easy. I'm pretty simple, right? Yeah. yeah. Good boy kind of situation. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I love it. I love it. I mean, we could go so much longer because this, there's so much in the program that we can talk oh, yeah. about and we can like educate people on. But um, you mentioned you were dabbling in a few other programs uh, before you joined mine. Which one did you join? Just curious. So um, a couple. Let's see. Which ones did I end up doing? I, 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 it was a lot of podcast stuff. So I listened oh. to, I found some of the Marriage Helper podcasts early on. And then um, High Thrive Marriage had some podcasts that I listened to. And then um, there was one, I'm trying to think what it was called. I want to say like peace and control or husband help. Okay. That's what it was called. Those were, okay. the, those were the three I ended up kind of, you know, bouncing around with. Or yeah. Can you tell me why you picked me in the end? Because, and here's the reason why I asked this question. Okay. I, I don't mean to bash on the competition, but I do not like the competition. Right, because well, I like them because they give us a lot of clients. Because our clients try them and they're like, "Oh, it's BS." Yeah. Um, but you know, our channel is smaller, right? And so when you look at those other channels, you're like, "Oh, these guys have clout. These guys have authority. Surely they must be better." But then it's like, "Oh man, how can I say this to you?" Right. So, what were the key things that you saw that was like, "Ah, let me pick Jeff." And what were the key things that you saw that was like, mm, maybe I shouldn't pick Jeff, if you could be honest? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that's a very fair. So when I look at it, I said it in the very beginning, like that you speak to my brain was kind of was sort of that, that feeling. But it's to say that it's not that any of them had bad, in, like and it's not to say some of the information is definitely like controversial. You get different thoughts in everywhere, right? But it's, it's not that it was that like none of them were like, oh, this information is terrible to me. But it was to say that a lot of it just felt very like hopes, dreams, soapbox and kind of useless where it was mm-hmm. like, OK, yeah, I get it. Like work on myself, but there's like, not love each other, depth. whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, there wasn't a lot of depth. There was just like a lot of like <laughs> acceptance. And, you know, I, I, I in, to be honest, I kind of felt like a lot of them were speaking to an older mindset about relationships Mm. and what i mean by that is like you and i have talked a lot about this concept and i know you've shared a lot with the group that like obviously your partner she's extraordinarily successful um the modern relationship is two brilliant successful people that choose to be together Mm. our parents were raised you know at least my parents were raised they were like the first generation that like divorce was even a choice. <laughs> and the generation before that was like, you meet someone in your hometown, you live in your hometown, you die in your hometown. <laughs> so like, I'm like two generations from like the most closed minded life ever. Um, and I know you and I have talked and I've alluded to you that I like to travel. We're like, you know, I went to 50 countries in my twenties. So like, I don't, I'm not going to live in a teeny box with a closed mind. There's a big world out there. We have social media and all those things. And so there are lots of options. There are lots of opportunities. There's lots of different lives you could live. There's lots of paths. And so it's like the choice to be together is now one of many choices. And I feel like a lot of the other courses spend a lot of time like 
being like, step one, ignore all other choices. Step two, only focus on this choice. It's the chocolate ice cream conundrum we talked about before. Uh, and yeah. where for you, I felt like one, you empowered the individual that was trying to fight the relationship, but you empowered them to level up regardless of the outcome, mm-hmm. which I think was a very honest take on it. A lot of the other ones are like, you may not get your spouse back, but a lot of people do where you were like, this is really for you. Like, yes, <laughs> you get a lot of success, but this is about you. Stop making it about her. Oh, you're talking about her again. Shut up. Make it about you. I appreciated the where you focused us, what you focused on, and also that idea that you wanted to level us up so that we were better fit to engage in all aspects of life. So I think you just mm-hmm. translated better. Um, and it goes back to becoming actually irreplaceable instead of just being like, hey, find a spouse that's going to commit to you and put their tunnel vision on. Oh, not the right spouse. Maybe the next time. This one was more of a, gotcha. hey, be the best you. So I appreciated that. Gotcha. Yeah. And I think it's also the difference between like how we conduct our programs too, where like, I will never do the three-day retreat. It's like, there's no way you can reconcile, you can work on yourself, you can grow in a three-day retreat. There's no way. And the only way that can happen is if like, you just tell each other, oh, uh, we are married, so we have to be husband and wives. We yeah. have to commit to each other. That's the only thing you can do. But it's like, again, it's like, okay, it doesn't really get anywhere, you know? Yeah, um, no, I agree. And I, I like the way it is set up. I, I mentioned before, obviously, I'm, I am, since I'm a coach, I have convinced myself I'm a do-it-yourselfer. There are components of your program that I can dive into on my own. It's on my time. I can do those things. I like that piece. Um, the, the way your group is set up internally, the way we interact with each other, that's the other piece is like, it's only for looking forward, it's looking for positives. It's iterating. It's not sob stories. It's not like, oh, woe is mm. me. I need a shoulder to cry on. It's, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what I'm thinking I want to do about it. I invite criticism in because I'm a proactive forward progress person. <laughs> yes. I like the attitude that you kind of convey there. Um, and you know, it's funny. It's like you said, not to bash on competition too much, but like, I listened to one of the podcasts with the group that does the retreats is what I'll vaguely state. Um, and I, it's, I like the podcast, but it, in that this was early on in my situation, the husband and wife that got interviewed, they like fell apart. Wife had affair, husband had affair, went to retreat, got back together. Wife left again. They divorced for three years and then they got back together. And it's like, and now they're now they're happy forever. And I'm like, well, one, I guess on one side, I'm happy to hear that like people can end up together after such a roller coaster dynamic. But it's also to say, like, did your product actually do anything in this situation? Like, I don't, I'm not right. sure that was the the game changer, right? What I'm hearing is that they both had to like mature, and it took them a really long time because they didn't have proactive guidance. Your course is the proactive guidance. I matured in six months in a way that many would take six years because of what you've done. Yeah. And they always tout this particular group. I know that's how like 70% success rate. Like, I don't prove know it. how you measure that. First and foremost, it's like, yeah, prove yeah, it. It's exactly. like, whatever. I, I don't, yeah. I don't know how do they do that, but. Um, I will tell you that was the there? Yeah, I go ahead. like there's a couple uh, of forums. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say there's a couple of forums that like my, you know, social media is attached to. And I will say that like, you can't measure reconciliation like objectively in a great way, but I will say that the number of reconciliations slash improvements and growth exists in our group is astronomically higher than the sob stories <laughs> and the step in. It's yeah. like, if, when you look at the amount that are like, well, uh, yeah, it's, it's all said and done. So it's just to say that I, I will say that while it's hard to maybe put an objective number on, I, I would suggest that. Yours seems to um, create the outcomes better because the better. focus is in the right place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> was there anything that when you first saw the videos that you were like, I don't know. I don't know about this guy. Ooh. Um, honestly, it's uh, so it's, it's funny. For me personally, no. And mm. it's because you speak my language. Um, there's this really good book out there. And I, it's, it's, uh, it's called The Four Core Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. It's just an observation of how we deal with expectations internally, externally. Long story short, I'm what's called a questioner. Mm-hmm. And you are too. And so um, what if I was going to profile you while we were recording? I apologize. But it's a profile. You're a questioner. And 
what we do is we like to dig in, we like to understand. And then once we have a good understanding, we internalize it, we embed it in our identity, and then we move forward with it. And so like your, the way you present information with like good level of detail, there's a good why behind it. I can connect with it. I need that. I think somebody looking for a quick fix, they're going to be like way too much information, way too much work. I think that certain personalities might listen to yours and think it's too technical. Mm-hmm. But to be fair, I think you're, like you said it yourself. When, when I think about all the guys I've interacted with, they're all technical, highly successful, detail oriented, somewhat anxious style of like, can do <laughs> all the chimes. You have a niche population. It's not to say it doesn't help others, but you definitely allure or draw in a group of people that have, again, the situation that's not unique. Like we've got a lot of pros. We've got a lot of you know things we do well, but we also have some glaring faults and you're the person that invites us to try and become a more complete person. Yeah. It's funny you say that. And I'll close off with this too, is we've recently also changed the way we filter the clients that come in. Mm. And I wanted to filter them so that I wanted to make it hard for people to apply. <laughs> like I want them to answer a lot of questions. I want them to like follow a bunch of rules and instructions because I'm like, if you cannot follow the instructions before, you're not going to make it in the program. I'm sorry. Right? If you don't like the complexity, you're not going to make it. So we might as well disqualify ourselves so that we can make room for others. Yeah. Um, and I think that's been working well for us. We're like, I'm actually getting better clients that I actually enjoy working with, et cetera. And I can save more lives that way while not killing myself at the same time. So <laughs> you brought that up. But yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, so I, I, don't uh, I know we're like, go, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, I think that's brilliant and from a business perspective. It's like I have a, a business mentor that that's kind of one of his, his common go-tos and I make it very hard to work for my company. And the reason is because I only want A players. I need a certain level of independence and a certain level of self-motivation. And if you're not willing to go through those initial steps, you've already told me that you're not going to do well here. And to be honest, that's okay because there's plenty of people that are really high talented that will. And so it's, it's always good to be in that position. And so uh, I, I think it's smart. You did it. And I'm happy that you're at that place. <laughs> to be yeah, honest. For sure, for sure. Yeah. I'm happy to, but well, um, guys, story. we'll close it off here. It's not an hour, 20 minutes. Wow. It just Whoops, flies by. I talk a lot. My bad. It's okay. I do too. But <laughs> um, guys, if you want to explore deeper into what Andrew's talking about here and kind of the, deeper nuances and for you to find your blind spots and really grow in the different layers to make you irreplaceable that you can enjoy the benefits of for the rest of your life here. Um, I want you to join me in my, my masterclass. We talk about the five pillars, the three layers. Uh, it's a very rudimentary look still into what we do. What we do is going to be a lot richer than that. Um, but if you want to do that, you can, some, uh, you can join that masterclass down below this video. If you want to submit your application for the program, you can do so at the end of the masterclass. Um, be sure to, again, fill out the survey and everything properly, because again, right now, we only take less than 10% of applicants. Um, so make sure you pay attention, pay attention to their, their instructions and so on. But uh, Andrew, any last minute advice? Buy the course three months sooner than you think you should. <laughs> and slow down and invest in it correctly the first time because it's not as urgent as you think it is. Perfect. I love it. I love it. All right, Andrew, I'll leave you to it. Um, thank you for doing this. No, oh, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. And thank you for everything. This, this has been life-changing. Honestly. For sure. For sure. We'll see you a lot more in the Facebook group. Yep. All right, man. Bye.